Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Prove Me Wrong podcast. Once again, I'm your host, Pete Lieb. I'm glad you're with me tonight, as always. With the start of the brand new NFL season now a few weeks old, and my beloved Cleveland Browns are over 500 for the first time in six years, uh, this year has provided many health concerns that the league has never really dealt with before due to the ongoing COVID-19 outbreak. And against that backdrop, there are still existing inherent risks to physical sports that haven't gone away and professional leagues are still grappling with. I have what I believe tonight will be a very interesting and important discussion revolving around the physical effects of contact sports and specifically repeated blows to the head of young athletes, even professional athletes. CTE or chronic traumatic encephalopathy is classified as brain degeneration due to repeated head trauma. And it's a topic that has really begun to dominate the landscape of not only professional sports, but again, it's also started to filter down to youth leagues. To combat CTE, changes have been made to the rules of the game. New technologies are being developed fast and furious in an effort to protect our athletes from long-term and permanent damage. And that's all a good thing, right? I mean, we want to there's nothing wrong with trying to make the game safer for those who are enjoying it. But how is that data that is driving this revolution collected? And is the science sound? Do we really have a significant problem here or is more research still necessary? And we are in kind of the early stages of our discovery. My guest tonight is Mr. Merrill Hodge, and we are going to talk about his book, Brainwashed, the bad science around CTE and the plot to destroy football. And if you're watching the YouTube channel, I have it up there on the screen right now. You can watch, you can see what it looks like there. Brainwashed attempts to set the record straight and explore the hidden agendas and misinformation fueling what Merrill calls the CTE hysteria machine. Merrill has had a successful career as both a running back in the NFL, spending a total of eight seasons between the Pittsburgh Steelers and Chicago Bears, as well as a long tenure uh, on air as an on-air analyst for ESPN. He is also a gifted and inspirational public speaker who encourages his audience to find a way to make your dreams happen, just like he did. In addition to Brainwashed, Merrill is also the author of Find a Way, Three Words That Changed My Life. And if you are interested in purchasing a book or scheduling a speaking engagement, you can find Merrill on his website, MerrillHodge.com, and on Amazon.com. You should also check out his website, BrainwashedBook.com, which will provide you with even more information on the topic. So uh, with that, I will welcome Merrill to the show. Hi, Merrill. How are you? Pete, I'm good, brother. Nice to hear you. Nice to see you. Uh, thank you very Here's much. <laughs> so um, for those who aren't familiar with your story, can you take just a moment and briefly fill us in again on your background and why you felt compelled to go against that official narrative and write your book? Well, um, actually, when I was listening to your intro, um, there was a few things that, that struck me. And there's there's a ton of misunderstanding. Um, and when people don't do their research or they're not informed, um, they say the incorrect thing. Mm -hmm. um, you're like you, you, you mentioned a lot of the safety and improvements that have gone on in sports is because of CT. And actually, that is incorrect. Um, all of the safety aspects of football was actually started in 1991. The first time that okay. ever cognitive testing was established in the history of sports was by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1991. Now I established that because you always have to have perspective. You have to go find out what information did anybody know about head trauma, concussions, how to care for it, how to treat it prior to 1991. You'll find nothing. Right. Nobody was doing cognitive testing. There was absolutely nothing done. <clears throat> um, let me use this perspective. This would be like if you had, if you could bring a pilgrim back and do your podcast and they're sitting complaining and arguing and being angry because there wasn't planes, trains, and automobiles <laughs> back in the day. You're right. People would laugh. They're like, well, because it wasn't around then. It wasn't great. So as we talk about this subject, we really have to keep that, that perspective. So to answer your question, <clears throat> My, what happened to me in my career, everybody thinks a concussion ended in my career. Completely 100% incorrect. If a concussion would have ended my career, I would not have played another down after the Monday night game when I sustained my first concussion. Mm -hmm. 
what happened to me, and this is critical in, in what I'm about to say, and it is where the narrative, quite honestly, has gone awry, because ultimately what I'm hoping we leave people with is they're empowered with the correct information to help deal with head trauma and understand that you can repeat and recover from head trauma and return back to the environment that you enjoy. And I use the word environment and I'll get to this in a second. Sports are not the leading cause of head trauma. In this country, the leading cause of head trauma is slipping and falling. Correct. You're yeah. the first person to get that right. <laughs> oh, really? Tripping and falling. Tripping and falling. Do you know what the next, uh, the next category would be? Oh. Objects. Yeah. Okay. Being hit in the head with something. Third, car wreck, car accidents. Sports isn't even a part of this horizon until right. we get All right, before I digress, let me go back to <laughs> the Monday night game. <clears throat> what happened to my career and what ended my career was improper care. Even in 1994, what I'm about to tell you was actually archaic and unheard of in 1994. Even though you only knew so much in 1994, we clearly didn't know what we know in, 2000, in 2020. I got cleared to return back to play five days later after having two, the two, the two greatest signs of severity for head trauma, which this is also something that is misunderstood. People think you have to lose consciousness. And if you lose consciousness, that tells you how severe it is. Absolutely incorrect. Yeah. Now, if you don't regain consciousness, well, that's the major symptom because you're not regaining consciousness. So it doesn't matter about evaluating anything else before that because you haven't regained consciousness. So we got to get you to regain consciousness. Once a person does regain consciousness, the two most important signs for severity of head trauma is cognitive recall and stability. Those two things are constantly measured throughout the evaluation process, the return to play. Now, once those two things have recovered, and how long they were, you know, disabled. In my case, there was some eight to 12 hours later, I was still, my stability wasn't very good. My cognitive recall was terrible. So if you're 12 hours into it and I'm coming up to you and I'm saying, hey, Pete, you remember the two things I told you um, uh, a little bit ago, what I want you to do tomorrow? And you're like, uh, no, I don't remember any of that. Okay, that's a big problem. Yeah. Okay, that's the problem I was having. So I, I just share that in the sense of, I get, I get cleared over the phone to return to play five days later after being asked one question, how you feeling? And even though I had a splitting headache at the time, I didn't know that was a symptom. Go back to 1994. What did we really know? So I, my career ends because of improper care. And that's ultimately where this whole thing has gone awry. And if you look at where we are today, when you look at the protocols that should be in place, what we know about care, and the most important part of care is understanding if there's any sign of head trauma, that person should be removed from that environment, whatever that environment is, immediately. And then properly evaluated, and if it's severe enough, get treated so they can return back to play. Now, all the things I just said, we could do 10 podcasts yeah. on this, but those things are significant and the important, most people don't even realize there's treatment for head trauma. Do you remember John Saunders? I mean, you, you seem like you'd yeah, be a guy. Absolutely, yeah. Hey, John Saunders was like um, a Mount Rushmore of ESPN. Mount, um, John Saunders had severe post-concussion syndrome symptoms for for almost two years, where he was he eventually came to me. Actually, we're in the war room watching Sunday night football because he used to do Sunday night stuff, and he came to me to get help for this. Where did he get his head trauma for? Let me back up. He tripped in a studio. Yeah. He tripped in a wow. studio. So he's having all these. Anyway, I get him to Dr. Um, to Mickey Collins at UPMC. I told him, I go, I listen, what's going to happen? Head trauma is very, it's, it's different than a lot of injuries. Like, you know, it's just, it lingers. It's long. It's an arduous process. And then one day it just clears up. And I go, you're going to know when that day is and you're going to call me. He's driving over the Walt Whitman. I think, no, this, the White Stone Bridge. He's driving the White Stone Bridge, calls me up, up there in New York, and he's like, oh my gosh, the fog lifted. So what I'm getting at is there's treatments, there's care for head trauma, um, and those are the important things. Um, when, you, when you mentioned CTE, 
I bet you what I'm about to tell you right now, you don't even know. CTE, and this is like one of like the staple standards of science that you must have. You can't, you can't, and you shouldn't progress further without this. It's actually the thing you would, you would hope it's the integrity of science. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things, the standards that you should live by, which has not been lived by here. There has been no consensus done on CTE. It is still a pattern in an observation state. Do you know how deplorable and harmful that has been to the American public and to people because Boston University has said it's actually a disease, which is 100% incorrect? In fact, Europe, I'm sure this, this is being postponed based on what we're dealing with right now, but they're trying to create a consensus group in Europe to go over a panel of scientists to go over this pattern to create a consensus. Now, who doesn't want that to happen? Oh, Boston University. Wow. Why? They've already declared it a disease. There is not enough research and science behind this pattern to declare it a disease. When you look at the people in the medical journal to this point, one third of them never played a sport, never had a concussion, never had a history of head trauma, yet they have that pattern. You have um, people as young as three years old that show that they have that pattern. So how can you sit there and point at a sport when you have no basis whatsoever to say that? There's no science, there's not one piece of scientific literature, not one. And this is important for people to understand because I'm talking about scientific literature and just so we have clarity. Yeah. Because I was talking to a journalist one time and he was emphatic. He was going to show me there's a cause and a link and he had the information behind it. And I said, okay, here, if you show me that scientific piece of literature, because I've read them all, I don't believe it exists. I'm going to shut up, pull my book off the shelves and you ain't going to see me anymore. Okay. He sends me a Sports Illustrated article. <laughs> I know we laugh, but yeah. that, that's that's your that's journalists out there. That's a journalist feeding you 100% garbage because he hasn't done his research. So um, I'll I'll stop there because I know that I've hit a lot of different things. I know you have questions, yeah. but the actual pattern of CTE is not considered a disease yet. Consensus hasn't been done. It got rejected in 2016. They tried to find consensus, but they couldn't. People remove themselves from the board and they're like, there is not enough evidence nor research to declare it an actual disease. So that has not been done. Boston University has moved on and created a disease mm -hmm. and a problem, keep in mind. But nobody has ever asked them the one word, the one question they never want to hear. Now, they'll dance around it in the court of public opinion. But if you brought them in the court of law, they'd go to prison for this. Can you prove it? They can't prove it. They don't have the scientific backing. They don't have any of the evidence that were required that would be required in the actual honesty of science to prove there's a cause or link. And guess what? Football specifically is causing it. Contact sports is causing it. Mm -hmm. And especially if you're going to play at a young age, it's causing it. None of that exists whatsoever. Has any of that improved at all since the, the original publication of your book? I know your book's a couple years old now. Has it improved right. at all, the transparency? I, I, think a lot, I think a lot has because, see, people, a lot of people don't know where to get the information. You know, and so some of the, some of the, um, uh, the lack of defense um, is when you're uninformed and when you don't know how to be informed. Now, here's what I just I had the luxury of doing. So let's back up. I didn't mean to write a book. I didn't want to write a book. That was, I had, I had people for a decade keep asking me, Hey, you need to write a book about your concussions, but you know what they wanted me to write it on. They wanted me to write on how the NFL was against me when I went to court, when I took the court, the doctor to court right. um, because of improper care. They wanted me to write a book on that. They wanted me to write a book on how the bears didn't have any protocol yet. The Steelers do. So they wanted me to bash the NFL and then the bears. I'm like, okay, the NFL made mistakes. They clearly did. We could talk about what they really know, knew versus what they really knew. And I can tell you exactly what they knew versus what they know. They just, they failed to act. They, they failed to act quick enough in the process. Well, I have all kinds of venom that I could throw at them, but they've, they've improved things. 
They've corrected their mistakes. The Chicago Bears, one of the first teams in NFL history to make cognitive testing mandatory after what happened to me. So they learned from their mistakes. They made the environment better. What is a book about trashing them going to do? Is that what people want to hear, that kind of garbage? Or do you want to be empowered about the truth, about the honest facts that really exist? So um, this book was really not it was, it was not my goal is to write a book. It, was, it wasn't until I got challenged by my last scientist, my neurologist, a brilliant lady in Canada, who I asked the same thing to her that I've asked to everybody else across the United States. What is CTE and how come football is causing this and hockey's mm-hmm. causing this? And she would stop me and say, wait a minute. She's the, she'd say the same thing that everybody else said to me. It is not a disease. We haven't had, we don't have enough information. It is a pattern we have discovered, but it's in an observation state. And then she challenged me. First one to challenge me, you need to read the scientific literature on this. If you'll read the scientific literature, you'll start finding your answers. And so once I started to read that, that is when the book came about. Cause I'm like, you can't talk about a podcast like this, about all the literature that exists mm-hmm. out there and make people understand it. But if I could condense it in a book, along with that and all the empowering things that exist in sports and all the treatments and therapies that are exist in sports. And that if you as a parent understood that you're not going to be in fear of your kids getting hurt. We don't, I'm a parent. I don't want my kids to get hurt. I'm a grandparent. I don't want my grandkids, but if they do, and guess what in life accidents happen, Mm -hmm. I don't know how to take care of it. I know what kind of areas I need to do to better to, to care for my kids if they do get hurt. Can I ask you, uh, going back to the Bears and the teams before that who didn't really have those protocols in place, you know, they're calling you on the phone for to make sure you're okay. How much of that is uh, maybe the player mentality of the time also, not wanting to be, you know, out of the game? You know, they were tough guys. They didn't want to, you know, they're, I'm, I'm fine, coach. They almost the knee-jerk reaction of how you feeling? How you feeling, Merrill? Fine, coach. Uh, versus these teams really should have understood, okay, because, you know, see no evil, hear no evil on their point. Merrill's saying he's fine. Put him back in the game. We need him, you know, for the touchdown. What, how much, what's the balance there in terms of culpability between, you know, the player mentalities at the time and where should the team have stepped in? Um, It's a good question and a fair question, and I think it's often misunderstood. People think it just exists in in sports. Mm -hmm. Listen, there's a man's mentality. You know, men have, I'm tough, I'm okay. So that exists outside sports, right? So don't sit there and say it's just sports. I mean, it's in life in general. There's a lot of people, oh, you know, it's okay. You know, oh, I'm not going to go. I'll get through this and, you know, versus going and addressing it right away. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the pioneer deal, the pilgrim thing. Okay, Joe Maroon. Dr. Lovell, these are two powerful names because they change history because they shoot. I'm not going to give them credit. If they were sitting right here, I'd say the same thing. I'm not going to give them credit yet because the guy who deserves the credit is Chuck Knoll. Joe Maroon comes in, who's the neuroscientist and the neurologist for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Who keep in mind, I think the Steelers at that time may be the only ones in NFL history that actually had him on staff. And this is back in the early 80s, mm-hmm. Okay. He tells, Joe Maroon tells Chuck Knoll, I don't think your quarterback, who was Bubby Brister at the time, on a Friday, can't play on Sunday because he didn't like some of the dialogue that took place after practice. And he had had a concussion the week before. Okay? Yeah. So he's like, I, you know, Chuck, I just don't think you should play. And Chuck's not, now Chuck's not like, oh, you know, no, I don't care what you say. Joey looked great. He's going to play. He's like, oh, Joe, if it's that serious, I think we, and it's that complicated. I think we need subjective and object, objective um, tools to evaluate this. Don't you think? So that sparks Joe Maroon and Dr. Lovell to say, geez, he's right. I mean, Chuck Knoll cared about his players. I mean, and he didn't want to jeopardize their health if there was that at risk, you know, and I, I know what you're hearing. I mean, You hear some of the stories about the Raiders, and I'm not saying that stuff didn't exist, and that doesn't exist in sports. In the environments that I lived in with the Pittsburgh Steelers, that didn't exist, okay? Um, The Chicago Bears, I'm not going to say it existed. They didn't have a neurologist on staff. They they didn't have – they didn't – case in point why I don't don't go see him to get cleared, okay? So 
they just didn't have the right proto people in place to operate with this. But then you go back. Now I'm going to back up to Joe Maroon and Dr. Lovell. When they get challenged by this and they create cognitive testing, they will tell you to this day, if you ever had them on your podcast, they didn't even know what they were doing at that time. They were just being challenged by a coach and they're like, yes, let's get another tool. And they were working their way through it. So that's in 1991. So mm -hmm. there's still a bunch of years they're working out to figure out, hey, what is this tool? How does it work? How effective is it? You know, that takes time. So it wasn't, I mean, I think every player wants to play and they want to work through things. Do teams want their very best player out there? Do I think it was more archaic 20 years ago than it was today? Absolutely. But that being said, you, you can't say that everybody knew this about head trauma mm -hmm. before anybody <laughs> was even doing cognitive testing. And they're like, ah, let's just throw caution to the wind and let's keep doing it. That didn't exist. Okay. Um, did, and I go back to, you know, cause the NFL, everybody attacks the NFL. I go, hey, listen, the NFL knew nothing about this. They didn't have any, any safe fact there had cognitive testing. And they're like, Oh no, the, Pittsburgh Steelers got away with cognitive testing. How'd they come up with that? Yeah. We already knew about it. They didn't know anything about it. They just, the only thing I would argue that you have legitimacy on is you're like, they didn't mandate it quick enough. Okay, well, I go back to the testing when Joe Maroon, if you go back and listen to them, they're like, they didn't know really what they had for years. So how can you sit there and go, the NFL should have done it in 1991 when the Steelers started doing it. Well, it's not well, they really didn't even know what they had. So that, that's the only air they made. It wasn't like they had all these secrets mm -hmm. and they were not going to let them out um, because they didn't want, they didn't care about the players. What is the most important aspect of the NFL? It's the players. Yeah. That's who you want to keep healthy. So, you know, I just, that, that's, that, that's not, that's not the case. And that's not, that's not the problem today. What is the real problem today is that you have, a absolutely criminal, corrupt scientific department in the Boston University lying about their science, doing things that are deplorable and harmful to people and lying about their science, saying the science says one thing, yet when you read it, it says it completely contradicts to what they say in the public arena and in the media arena. And that is, that is what's disturbing. And that's ultimately what drove me to write the book is to really explain what the science does say and what the facts are about head trauma. So just going back to what you had just mentioned previously with your story about the, the team, obviously things change, right? You're just using PTSD as, a, as an example too, right? You got men would come back from World War II and they, they would call it shell shock or they call it something else. Or, you know, the, the men, there were no treatments for that. They were just released back into you know, society and, and, you know, good luck. Uh, yeah. and, we, we, and then as time went on, we realized these people have some impairments, they need some help. And so, yeah, I can completely understand. My question now though is, what are the current recovery requirements? Because uh, again, it used to be, oh, he got his bell rung, you know, as if he's not like really physically wobbling around, he runs back into the, the, the huddle and he keeps going. What are the current recovery requirements once that concussion protocol has been failed? When they say, okay, you failed it, is there a, this is the minimum two weeks, or is it just, we take a couple of tests, how's your recall, what happens? Well, I'm going to use the NFL standard, sure. and Absolutely. keep in mind, what I'm about to say, okay, this is the NFL standard. Does this standard exist elsewhere in major colleges, in high schools, in youth sports, in your own home where somebody could slip in the shower, fall on a trampoline, I mean, be roughhousing, Okay. Absolutely not. But what I, when, I, when I finish answering your question, this is really what my goal is, is to get this type of information out so that we are caring for people in the right yeah. manner and giving them the right treatment so they can recover. So in the National Football League, there's a, the reason I was part of the return to play policy. I was part of that committee. Why is the tent there? What's the blue tent? Nobody even knows why the blue tent was created. I'll tell you why the blue tent was created. It was largely due to this. When we were talking about testing on the sideline, going through things, I was like, nah, that is the worst place for me. First of all, I can cheat. If you go, what's the score? Mm -hmm. I go 13, 14. Where are you? I look around the stadium. I'm like, okay, I can figure out some things and right. cheat on this thing. And I go, if there's just a turnover, there's emotions running me. That's not a cool place for me to answer questions. I don't want to do 
So the tent was created to take that away. Now, what goes on in the tent, you know, yes, there's stability. There's all types of cognitive. I mean, there's retrograde, anterograde. And if people don't know what that is, and I, I say this because, listen, I didn't know about those things when I heard about yeah. them the first time. So I don't want to just throw them out there and people go, well, what is that? Retrograde is this type of, 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 of learning. Some, some of that's repeated over the time. What's your name? Pete. Well, that's right. retrograde. Okay. Anterior grade could be, hey, Pete, what's, what's your host? What's your guest's name? You know, maybe because this is the first time you've ever met me. It's, so that's an interest. Okay. There's different ways to, um, to evaluate the brain and making sure that you're testing all areas from balance and cognitive recall. Okay. Now, if you struggle in that area, then we're removing you. We're taking you out and we're going inside. So it's, it's I mean, it's extreme what they're going through. They're going through a bunch of yeah. uh, layers that like, you're not gonna, you're not going to be able to fool them is what I'm saying. You're not going to be able to be that tough guy, you know, because, and listen, players are coming, becoming more smart. So I, I met with the military. I was in the Pentagon. I met with the military on this subject. Now, these are men who are dealing with life and death situations. Okay. You got a general out there who's leading these men and he's been concussed. Okay. <clears throat> Which is where I came up with the girl, the, uh, the term, a gatekeeper. Technically, when you think about head trauma, we're all gatekeepers. Pete, I've, I could give you a whole scenario of symptoms that you need to be aware of, okay? Right. Now, once I've educated you, informed you, you have a responsibility, and you're accountable for that. See, I can't sit there and do a test and tell if you got a headache. But you can tell me if you have a headache, and you have that responsibility to tell, to tell me. So before I get diver, I mean, digress yeah. and move on to the place, what I'm getting at is all of these tests are thorough and they're in-depth. Then we take you, if you don't pass them, then we're going to move you over to a protocol. And you got to start passing and going through these tests, but you got, you've got to do it through exertion and non-exertion because head trauma is not about just, in fact, listen to what I'm saying here. Almost 99% of head trauma, the last thing you should do is turn off the lights, close the windows, shut the doors and do nothing. You should be actively repairing ourselves based on the type of trauma you have had. Now, once I have done that, I go into all of these steps. I got to pass every day, a certain level cognitively and physically. Now, if I have a lapse, I got to start over again until I fully get recovered. Then I return to play. Well, that's a powerful thing. And the NFL is ahead of everybody and mm -hmm. they need to be um, credited for that. That's what they're doing. Everybody keeps talking about the mistakes they made. Get over it. Okay, they made some stupid mistakes. They made some dumb errors. Look at where they are today. And if you are not one of those people that are going to do that, then I challenge you to walk on water and prove to me that you've never made a mistake. And we're right. like, hey, listen, I learned from my mistake. They learned from it. They moved on. What is important about that, Pete, that's what we need in all environments. We need every parent to realize, okay, greatest, greatest chance of your son or daughter having uh, an accident. They might trip and fall, slip in the shower, fall off the trampoline. Um, be at a park, have an accident. So how do you care for that? And if they do have head trauma, it's not doom or gloom. There's ways to recover, repair. Let me just leave this website with you because this will give information for people. Okay. Re RethinkConcussions.com. That'll guide you to the proper care and treatment that will help you if you need head trauma. Uh, if you've had head trauma and you need some type of care, so getting people information out there that there is treatments, there is the proper care for it. You can repair from it. That's a powerful thing that it does exist. I watched it with my own son who started playing age football at age seven, who has his first concussion his freshman year, four days before his first bowl game in Las Vegas. He has con a concussion on day four before the bowl game. How? He slips in the shower. It isn't even on a football field. And I'm talking to people. Here's what's crazy. And they're like, well, it didn't happen on a football field. I'm like, it happened. I'm like, it doesn't matter where it happens. Right. He can't play. He's ineligible. Even I was just like, Bo, you're one of the most gifted athletes I've ever seen. How did you slip in this? Now, who in the world hasn't almost slipped or slipped in a shower? Right. I was For everybody. Sure. So, it, and, and then you think of dorm showers. Well, shoot, I mean, I think the risks even double or maybe triple in that environment. But my point is, 
I had, he, he actually, it was severe too. You know, you hit your, your head on some tile and you, without protection, right? you can have some serious, and he had a lot of issues with that. I eventually took him, but I watched him recover as he went through the treatment and the protocol that Dr. Collins put him through. And what, what empowered me about the whole thing, because I, I looked at Bo, actually, let me back up. When we were going in for his evaluation, Bo looked at me, he's like, hey, dad, are they going to tell me I can't play anymore? And I said, well, if they do, you have something that severe that you shouldn't play. So that's a good thing that we're not jeopardizing you by continuing to play. Right. But I was like, Bo, let's not, let's see what the doctor says. Anyway, the doctor said, absolutely, Bo, though. That's not, not even not the, the case in your scenario right now. They gave him a plan. Within, I think it was about six days, five or six days after going through the protocol, even on the phone, he sounded different. There was a clarity about it. And my brother, his, my nephew plays, plays, plays at BYU as well. He happened to see him the day before I talked to him. He's like, man, I, Bo just looks, there was a clearness about Bo. And I could hear in his voice, the voice, there was a clarity. And what I'm trying to get at and what I want people to say, the treatment that he went through was incredible. And it did get him better. And he returned back to the environment. And he hasn't sustained another concussion since. Now he's graduated and he's done with football um, since then. That was a couple of years ago. But I seen it with my own eyes that 25 or so years ago, I had something very similar. And they said, hey, listen, you got to retire. And we got no help or plan for you. Right. We're just going to give you two years to recover. Now we're able to help you within se less than seven days or less than two weeks to be completely recovered, to return back to the environment in a safer way. But do you think, um, so you're saying really there is no minimum time limit. It is just how, how long it takes you to pass the protocols. Do, has there ever been any thought that maybe it is just a minimum two week, even if you finish it in six days, we give you another eight days, you know, another to give you that full 14 days. You've passed the protocols. Let's just give you another week to let any, I don't know, if there's potentially a swelling or any, any other issue going on inside and just give you that little bit extra time uh, of healing or you well, know, and that's just um, i'm thinking that even for just wide receivers people who aren't banging their head on every play like interior linemen or running backs would be maybe even more right now when you think about banging their heads every play see that, that i'll tell you this that that doesn't happen as okay. much now, now first of all the helmet today is a hundred percent better than it was 10 years ago a hundred percent i was going to say that to you merrill i was going to that was literally a question 1990, when I was a wide receiver for the Richmond Heights Spartans, I guarantee that helmet that I was wearing was probably worn by a Richmond Heights Spartan in 1980. It may have been worn by a Richmond Heights Spartan in 1975, for that right. matter. So, you know, that was my next question was also, how is there a um, an expiration date on this equipment? How yeah. often should a high school be replacing their helmets? Well, I, 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 there's a pretty strict standards now, and I think okay. it's every year or two years, and they okay. have to because I know I coach youth football for years, and that's what we did. That I think we had to we, every five years we had to get new helmets. I forget the actual, I, I forgot the actual standard that we had, but mm -hmm. there is an actual standard from how you how they have to be um, reconditioned and or changed, and they have like it's a year or two or three years. So there's. Okay. There's a policy in place there, but I'm going to go back to your experience. So let's now forget the science. Yeah. Let's, let, let's apply some common sense to things. Okay. Did you say 1980? It was, uh, well, I was playing in 1990. So it was probably okay, 1990. Yeah. Okay. 1990. Now you're one of several hundred millions of people who yeah. played in that hundreds of millions who just in the United States, if we want to include Canada and throw hockey in there. Over a hundred years of football, when there was no protocol, equipment was paper mache to what we have today. Absolutely, and really, and there was absolutely no protocol or care for head trauma. Instruction was terrible, if any. Okay, the helmet so barely all, fit. I mean, I mean it, the helmet just wobbled when you ran. I mean, it barely fit on your head. It was, yeah, it was bad. Now, that, that, now, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I went through <laughs> the proper fitting of a helmet. Okay, yeah. now that being said. And all of this should exist in your sport. And if somebody's listening to this right now, well, shoot, that doesn't exist in ours, then get them out. I don't care what sport it is. If they don't have answers for protocols, if they're not doing their equipment right and the instruction is terrible, then remove them. And, and, and it's not just football. That would be any sport where that's not being done. That being said, so we have hundreds of millions of people who have played in that type of environment. Yeah. 
if you're telling me that football is causing something that you have no scientific evidence to back, by the way, are you telling me we're, we, how many cases would we need to create an epidemic? If you understand statistics, if there's hundreds of millions, I am going to tell you this, we're probably going to need at least a million. Yeah. We're going to need a million to cause up and we're going to be able to clearly say football caused this. You don't have one and don't go saying, Oh, well, they found this, uh, the, the, remember the New York study, 110 out of 111 mm -hmm. brains. Okay, let me tell you what kind of garbage that paper was. First of all, 111, they use that as the denominator. What is the denominator? The, the denominator in any statistic is the total number right. of people who played in the National Football League. It's not 111. It's 27, over 27,000. So that 111 is not your denominator. What they're looking at is a numerator. And then if you looked at that paper and that research, here's where how, just one other layer of corruptness. This is a criteria and a standard and how bad journalism is quite honestly. There's a standard in science. When you have something that is unknown, what CTE is unknown. And it was clearly, it's unknown today. Mm -hmm. As far as the disease, it is a pattern. But clearly several years ago, it was no disease. Consensus has not been done on that. It still has not been done on that. And it says in the scientific work and research, if you ever have some pattern that is unclarified and unknown, if you have another neural brain disease, you must exclude that pattern of, un, of abnormality or unknown, which is CT. Well, when you look at all of those brains they looked at, you know how many other brains had another type of disease, another type of dementia or Alzheimer's, some type of brain disease in it. 57 other brains. So what it should have said and what the paper should have said and what it should have been cleared if you're a journalist and you do the right thing and you have integrity as a journalist, which this journalist is absolutely trash when you think about what a journalist should be, you have to apply that to your article. So right. it's not a hundred and a, it's not 110 out of 111. It's like 55 out of 111, but that's not going to catch your eye, is it? And if you really want to be honest, it's 55 out of 27,000. That's not going to catch your eye. That's not a good headline. So they leave that, they, they, they spin that type of garbage to you. And what's unfortunate with people, they believe it. Instead of doing some research and understanding some facts, I'm like, they actually believe it. But part of the problem, though, is also that there were 27,000 people, but we weren't able, we're not able to test 27,000 brains. So you, the other issue you're having is how do we obtain more brains to sample? Well, if you have to wait for people to pass away, then you have, you have to get their well, a, a approval. Would you be in, in favor of just to, in, if an athlete, whether it be a hockey player or a football player or a boxer, uh, would you be in favor of maybe if if they commit suicide or if they die of an accident prior or or just that part of their autopsy is a CTE um, review just to, to validate and just to be able to pick up that I, number? I'm going to go back to the research to this point. Every brain should be looked at like that. Yeah. One third of the people in yeah. the medical journal never played sports, Pete. So why see you're actually see that mindset is part of the problem. This is not just existing sports. Okay. You sit there and say, oh, it's just a sport thing. The science already tells you it's not a sports thing. You got one third of them that didn't play sports. Look at all of them. What happened to not one woman's brain, not one female brain in that deal. Hmm. Okay, well, how do you exclude another gender and think, sit and think you're going to come up with any type of scientific direction or answer? They'd flunk you if you were in high school, if you did this kind of garbage. Then they would. They'd be yeah. like, are you kidding me? Do you know how unsound this is? Do you know how abusive this is? And you actually, and in this level, do you know how corrupt it is and how criminal it is? They can't answer any of this stuff. If you got them on there and you just put them on the spot, you put Ann McKee on there, you put any one of those guy, people up there, and you go, well, listen, show me your scientific evidence where there's a cause and a link, where you can verify that. You can prove that. You can prove that sports has caused that. I don't want you to say it to me. I want you to prove it to me. Like, I can prove it to you. In my book, it helps you do that. I am an open book. I want you to be skeptical. Go ahead. I, I'll give you all the information. I'll let you read it. You can go get the, the information. This isn't like we wrote a bunch of papers and it's our thoughts versus their thoughts. I'm using their stuff. 
I'm using their stuff. Like I went to the court of law, we would be using their information against them. I'm also concerned. I'm also confused maybe about the idea of the terminology disease because disease is something you catch. To me, this is more like a sports injury. If they were, if they were claiming that contact sports cause it, it's almost like a sports injury. Yeah. I mean, it's like if you ripped up oh. your knee and then you have arthritis in your knee for the rest of your life. Well, okay. This is actually a great question for this reason. I was, I was like, why do you guys call everything a disease? Yeah, exactly. Can I tell you, can I tell you what a freckle is? Sure. A freckle is a disease. It's an abnormality of the skin. It's a scientific disease. Oh, wow. Now, does that mean you're going to get cancer? Well, no. no. I mean, yeah. but the, so what I'm getting at is they see all, they see a lot of patterns in the brain, you know, and, and we all have tau buildups. I mean, it's just like people who have more freckles than, than, than people that don't have freckles. That is how our brains can be as well. There can be a lot of different tau patterns and it means absolutely nothing that you're going to have cognitive issues later in life. They see this all of the time. So to create this narrative out of something like the NIH is just as responsible because people go, you know, I'm sure people listen like, well, why would they do that? Do you know how many hundreds of millions of dollars they've been getting because they've created a problem? Hmm. I mean, and the NIH not to ask, Hey, uh, let's, let's, what can we prove that? Can we even prove that you even have anything to say what you are saying? Absolutely not. They're just as they're just as corrupt and just as bad in this whole process. And in the narrative that they allow to go out, and then the journalists that cover it, and I use that term loosely because in my book tour, it, I, I, this is Peter. This is the honest truth. One hundred percent of the people who sat down to interview, one hundred percent, from New York to L.A. to Canada to Chicago to Pittsburgh, you name it. I'd ask him, have you read any of the scientific literature on the subject we're about to talk about? No. 90% of them, they're going to talk about my book. I go, did you read the book? No. So we're going to do an interview on a subject you know nothing about. That's interesting to me. And then you're going to spew whatever direction you want when we're done to people who are actually going to believe you. And that is harmful. I mean, that, that is so irresponsible. And it's not just the people doing it. It's the clowns that are hiring them. Then saying it's okay. That's okay to present this information to people when we don't know. It's okay not to give them all the facts. It's okay that you don't go do the research before we present the story. And it is just, it, it just it's damaging to people. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, when you think about... Um, and what this book was ultimately about, it was for parents. I'm passionate about kids. Um, I love my kids without end. Um, this whole thing was focused on our youth. When you think about what is one of the biggest problems in this country with our young people. In fact, the United States, we should be really proud. We are the number one country in what I'm about to tell you. There's not even a country that's close to us. We're the most obese country. Oh, absolutely. In the world. For sure. In 20, I think it's 2030, we will, 70% of America will be obese. Do you know how disgustingly sad that is? And do you know what? It is self-inflicted. Absolutely. This is not like, well, we didn't see it coming. Okay. When you think of the sugar intake and the inactivity that goes on, and then this is a little deep. When you think about, and this, this I can give you scientific literature on. I'm not making this up. These are, and I've even actually lived this. There's a thing called ACEs that someone will, we all experience in life. I'm going to list some things you may have experienced them. These are facts that cause cognitive ailments and issues later in life. And even things like lung disease and cancers and all kinds of issues later on. They're called ACEs in a, in a, in a child's life. Things like this, a death of, love, death of a loved one, bullying, um, uh, verbal abuse, sexual mm -hmm. abuse drug abuse, all of them. And there's a whole list of things, but these are called ACEs. So the more ACEs that one experiences in their life as a child, they can develop issues later in life. And this is a scientific fact. This is proof. This is not a made up thing. Now, one thing helps those kids that had a lot of ACEs and remedy themselves actually is sports. Sports allows you to develop self-esteem, confidence, do a lot of things about building relationships and character and yourself. Yeah tools for life why do i identify this i lost my mom at a young age i know the sting of death 
I know the grieving process. I know this. When I went to football practice, I, that was my sanctuary. There's where I gathered peace for the three hours that I was there to help me through that grieving process. Um, those are the things that if you pay, if you want to be a, a, a parent that is invested in your kids, those are things that we should be thinking about caring for our kids. Our kids need to be active. They need to be so. I don't want our kids to get hurt either. But if they right. do, there's ways to take care of that. And we will take, and you, you can take care of them. If you're going to sit there and go, I don't ever want them to get hurt, then they better not be doing anything outside of your home. And even in your home is probably the most dangerous thing they're going to do as young kids. But if we're empowered about things, we're less likely to be afraid and then let our, and quite honestly, you enjoy life better. You I, develop in life better if you are not afraid of things. I mean, I, I agree with everything you said about youth sports, 100%. I mean, I, I, I as well, I didn't have a father figure growing up. My father figures were my coaches, were either my football coaches, my track coaches. I, I ran track as well. And to the point where I even, I, I was, I don't know, 35. And I said to my wife, I said, I want to coach track. And just out of nowhere. And she's like, what, why? And I was like, because those men made such an impression and such uh, an imprint on me personally. I want to do that for somebody else. And so, you know, I literally, I coached track for five years just, just for that reason, because I wanted to have that impact on, on younger people. And I agree with you a thousand percent, but I do, it is something I lament is that now the, you know, you have these, these football games on sport, on PlayStation. You you can be amazing in this football game on PlayStation, but you can't run 15 yards yourself. Right. And, and, a and a lot of kids nowadays just don't realize how much fun it is to catch a ball and run past somebody and just run past them. You know, and it, it, it's a great it, it's the greatest feeling in the wor in the world to outrun someone to to you know and, and blow somebody up every now and then. You know, you, you tackle them and and sure. that is so much fun. And we're losing it to your point. And yeah. this obesity is just running rampant. It really is. But well, Pete, to add to, you know, to just to add to that, and I, and I don't want, and I don't think you're saying this either, and I don't, my son played Xbox as much as anybody, but yeah. you know what he also did? He was outside playing yeah. basketball and running around too. And as long as he had that balance, I'm like, that is just fine. Now, somebody that's just gravitated right. towards there, <clears throat> there's actually a greater, they have a greater risk of health issues earlier and longer in life than anybody that stays active. That is just yeah. an absolute fit, and not just physically, but mentally as well. When we don't keep ourselves in a in a healthy manner from nutrition and movement, that affects not I, I, I say this because everybody there's so many people that goes, Well, I didn't know that that was part of your your brain. Okay. Your body is a is. part your brain's a part of your body. Yeah. Okay. It's overall health is a vital component to nutrition and movement. You must have that as a party life. Those things jeopardize your short and your long-term health when you fail to do that. Now, I'm not saying it's got to be football, but it's got to be some type of activity where you're investing in your health or eventually it's going to catch you and it's going to catch you earlier than it's going to catch you later when right. you don't mess like that. And I was going to ask you about that because you were talking about physical activity and, and healing the brain and you were talking about protocols. Are some of those protocols, I mean, I don't know what those protocols are when you say that. Do you mean like a light therapy or maybe a reaction therapy or catching balls? Well, I mean, what I, are they I doing? Mean, just, you and I could have, a, we could play in the same game, both have some type of concussion, uh -huh. okay? You and I go to the same caller. Let's say we go to Dr. Collins, okay? Based on his evaluation of you, your treatment might be different than okay. mine. Now, when I'm saying cognitive stuff, like my son, I'll use my son's example. That's the best one I have because it's the first one I ever watched. He had to do every day... He had to like read things and move his head like this. Um, he had to do a bunch of different activities like yeah. this, reading stuff up and down, moving his head back. Then his cognitive, I mean, his physical stuff, his, his physical stuff wasn't riding a bike and being neutral. His physical stuff was being active, start, stop, move, shift. You know, when I do core, I don't just do core this. I, I twist, I turn because of the, um, oh, I'll come up with it. Um, Oh, the, uh, the vestibular area, mm -hmm. you know, the vestibular area, that needs to be retrained. It's very similar to this. You, you're probably old enough just to remember, remember when they used to do the, the knees back in the days, used to be a big zipper. You might not remember this. A zipper, they used to put a, a big old train track down the middle and you would, they would cast your leg and oh, they wow. would keep that like that for six months. Then they would take you out of the cast and it would take you another six months to see if you could actually run 
walk, let alone run and play sports again. Okay. Right. Now what do we do? We got four holes and we're moving the next day. Just like that. Yeah. Okay. That's ultimately kind of how the the rehab and training process that we have done with our brain in such a quick period of time is identifying where the brain has been traumatized and doing specific things to help recover it and repair it so that we know that it's better because you know you just went back isn't two weeks good enough actually that's the first protocol i ever gave to our government in 2011 i sat in front of congress and i established the protocol that i had established way back in 2003 and then it had implemented and it had become i quantify i was the first person to ever do a cognitive i mean having a, a a cognitive a value, a cognitive protocol for head trauma in youth sports. Mm -hmm. I take this to, to Congress. I spoke in front of Congress and I gave them the protocol that I believed we should have had for all of sports. I challenged them in 2011, do this for all sports and we'll make the environment much better and safer. And part of that was being out for a total of two weeks. Yeah. See, even from, see from 2011 to where we've come today, now they're, they've implemented specific treatments and ways to recover and repair so we can return to play. So, you know, staying out an extra week would be like your ankle is all better. No, listen, I don't, I'm not saying the brain and the ankle are the same thing, but I'm right, saying sure. injury is an injury when we're recovered. Right. Why can't we return to play? Why should I sit out an extra week when we, we know that we have fully recovered? You know, you don't do that for an ankle. And if you know you're fully recovered from your brain, and these doctors don't clear you. Doctor, they're not going to let you go. If let's say, no, this is completely recovered. We know it from every sign, every symptom, every angle that we have looked at. And now we can return back to fire because nobody wants that on their head. So they're very confident in that aspect of, of the of your return to play. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm just more, I would be more concerned because my brain is imminently more valuable than my ankle or my arm or my what? knee. See, Pete, not to interrupt you, but I think yeah. that you, you got a great point. And why not um, have, listen, you are responsible for your health as much right. as anybody. Why not? And, and I don't think any player does not have the right to go, you know what? I, I just want to wait another week. Just yeah. To make sure. yeah. Then there's nobody that would say, oh, I'm a coach, but somebody player said that to me. I'm like, absolutely. If that's what you want. I do that. But man, the pressure on professional athletes. I, and I go, I think of uh, Derek Rose. He was an NBA player, right? And he, he, I think he blew out his knee and the doctor said he was technically healed and Derek was not ready to play. And the amount of, whether it was mental, whether it was physical, whatever the reason was, the amount of um, stress and feedback and, and, and that he got from not only the fans and, and others around him that, you know, what's wrong? Are you soft? You know, giving him all this hassle. I mean, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking of is unfortunately others will be putting that kind of pressure on the athlete who says, you know what, I'm not ready to play regardless of what the doctor says. Um, that's, that was my only concern about it. Was, uh, yeah, I, well, I agree we'll with saying that. I'm not ready, but then yeah. there's a lot of other things involved outside of me just saying that you know, with, with public opinion. Yeah, well, I've used, um, I've used common sense, and this is a very critical component. Very few, very few people, I think, use common sense anymore. For um, sure. You are your best doctor. You yeah. are your best um, sensor. And like, you know, like when I'm coaching youth kids at, at any level, I've coached from youth to pro, every environment. And I've always said this to my coaches, we always trust our athletes, okay? Like when when athletes says I'm hurt or they're doing this and it doesn't, trust your athlete, okay? Trust, they know their body, people mm -hmm. know their bodies better than you. And I've always tried to encourage athletes, listen, you, your gut is right. Where do you feel, all right? Is there gonna be some people who milk it just absolutely, yeah. okay? Man, let's not let's throw that out. Absolutely, that's gonna happen. That being said, I'm always gonna trust my athlete, and I'm always gonna give them that window. And I don't think that I don't think anybody would close that window, especially with the environment that exists today. They're like, man, I just something doesn't feel right. I just need another week, mm -hmm. you know. And um, then you got to be strong enough, you know, if it gets out and you're in the professional environment to withstand, you know, the unfortunate. Yeah, abuse you're gonna get. Yeah, you know exactly. It's like, listen, my my health's a heck of a lot more important than listening to your old garbage. No you know? doubt. Another week for me is a lot more self assuring, and if that's if that feels the case, let me just tell you this: when I go back to the protocol I established, when you talk about where we are today, that was my rule: two weeks. Okay, in my seven years of coaching my son from seven to fourteen, I had two incidents where I had to remove a kid and he didn't play the next week. Two. Mm -hmm. Age 13, age 14. Both kids 
Well, let me, let, let me rephrase this. Who do you think came to me the week that they could not play and said they were ready to play? Probably their dad or their parent. Mom. Mom, yeah. Mom. Mom can't. I'm, I'm telling you this. I, they, they, here's what they tell me. Uh, it was almost identical. They're like, like God, he is, he's been yeah. running around. He's got so much energy. He looks so good. And I'm like, are you sure? She goes, oh, yes. I go, I, and I'm like, that's exactly what I wanted to hear. She goes, well, can he play? And I'm like, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that's my rule. Because Now, why? Now, because in my research, I did discover majority of head traumas, okay, concussions, you know, in sports, in the environment I'm talking about, everybody from, from a Joe Maroon to, you know, um, um, Lizzie Hazarati to you, you name it, people, they all say the same thing to me. A two-week window with most concussions is you know ample time before they return to play so yeah. I, so this is in 2003 keep in mind Kate. i didn't know what we know today we didn't have treatments and all this stuff to get, help get them better to return to play so i was like that's why i made the two-week rules like we're just we're gonna we're gonna err on the side of caution yeah. we're gonna go two weeks and that's the way it is i don't care if it's gonna be your last game you know the last game you get to play in youth sports that's the way it's going to be unfortunate. It never happened like that, but everybody, everybody who wanted me to play their kid was their mom. Um, I like two how weeks. That has, how that has changed? Yeah. No, no, no doubt. No, I, I like two weeks. That that sounds that sounds good to me. I have two more questions, if that's okay. I know we're we're coming up against it here. Sure. My first question is, you know, the title of your book says um, not only the science behind CTE, but the plot to destroy football. What is the the agenda to destroy football? What do you mean by that? Who's trying to destroy it and how? Well, all you got to do is go look at Boston University. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they're trying to create policies to ban tackle football. Okay, yeah. now wait a minute. Let's just back up. How, where, where, does head trauma happen in soccer? I would assume, yeah. Of course it does. Yeah. It happens. Well, I'll just make this simple. Where head trauma it? happens in every sport. Yeah. Okay, it exists in all sports. Why would you just target football? Why would you just say football? And then why, how, and this is what kills me. This, this tells me that when you think of um, how, uh, how disgustingly ignorant and uninformed they are, they say to start playing tackle, you can start playing tackle football at age 14. Now, as soon as I heard that, Something, a, a red flag goes off right away. I'm like, okay, somebody knows nothing about A, you sports, the body, and they clearly don't know anything about the brain. And I'll explain that in a second. Mm -hmm. Something magically happens around age, age, age 13 and 14. In almost, well, not in almost, in every human being, it happens. Puberty. Right. Kids go from 105 to 165. I have been on teams where I'm coaching and guys are in, kids are in diapers. Next year, they got beards. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? You know, now it's okay to start playing at age 14. Now let's go back to the brain development. By age five, 90% of the most critical development in our brains is done by age five. It now the rest, the other 10% is not done till 25. Right. Why in the world? Is it okay when developing is still going on? And you can't sit there and tell me, well, it's more important at this stage. Than the development of the brain is development of the brain. It's all important. You're telling me it's okay at age 13 and 14 when impacts are much more severe. Right. Kids right. now are much bigger and stronger and faster. And I can tell you from experience and living it personally as a coach and as a parent, from 7 to 11, the impacts with the gear they have on just aren't significant enough. Could right. you have a concussion? Absolutely, you could. Did I ever experience one of that age? Never. But I did it 13, and I did it 14. So why, Boston University, was it okay to start now playing contact football at age 13 and 14? You have zero scientific evidence to back that whatsoever. And then they say, oh, well, you might play flag, drive and flag as if it's safer. Listen, mm -hmm. I love all aspects of football. Any way you can play it, you should. But to sit there and sell people that flag is safe, okay, that's another absolute lie. I've had more kids injured without equipment on, more head trauma without any headgear 
by playing flag football. Yeah. In fact, statistics will tell you there's more injuries in flag because you don't have equipment on. And if you are playing flag without headgear, I don't even know what kind of thought process you could possibly have on. You have a chance to protect your most vital organ and you don't do it. If you're going to think a bunch of young kids are going to run around and not bang into each other, you have lost your mind. Just as many head traumas and some of them more severe in, you, in, ta- in flag football because they don't have headgear on. So to sit there and drive that and sit there and say it's only football when it's happening in soccer, baseball, basketball. I think in 2015, the NCAA put out all of these. They, they, they threw out the, num- the numerator of concussions in sports. They had, here's the first thing I saw. Every sport was represented. Yeah. Every sport. So I'm like, okay, but they're only going to pick out football. Why'd they pick out football? Because it had the most incident rates. However, if you throw and do the right math and you know anything about statistics, let's throw the denominator in there. Well, if football has the most concussions, they also have the most players. They have 100 players. When you throw the denominator in there and you do the math, leading cause of head trauma, wrestling. Second leading cause, women's basketball. Third, wow. soccer. Fourth, football. When you start adding up, why? Well, football has 100 players. Basketball, soccer, all they have what do you 12 to 15 to 20. I mean, football has four times as many. So you have to calculate all of that to get the truth, but people don't do that kind of stuff. So that is why you okay. target one sport. So that, that tells me how corrupt and ignorant you are right there. You have an agenda that's wrong. You have an agenda that's rotten. Instead of empowering people and helping people, you're trying to scare people. And I think when you do that, people should be held accountable, especially when you're lying about it. You would think as, as well with the, with the tackling update they've been, you know, with the heads up and how that, you know, the, the form tackling and how, and how that needs to be done. You would think they would want to teach that around seven or eight when those impacts are not as violent. Give them a chance to learn the proper way to tackle someone before they are big and strong and just come flying in there and, you know, hurt their neck or, or you know, hurt themselves really, really badly with bad form. Pete, so I, Pete, I, you I, what you're using? I'm using common sense. Uh, exactly right, Pete. <laughs> and that's, and that, and that, when you do that, that's dangerous. Do you, do you know who came up with uh, heads up football? No. You know that tackling technique? Where is he? I'm looking for my book. Oh, that handsome man, huh? Oh, Chuck Knoll. Chuck Knoll. There you go. Okay, I pulled that book down for one reason. He talked about these techniques. He at the NFL level, this is what I'd hear all the time. You're a better, safer player when you do what? Same foot, same shoulder, rising blow, first contact wins. I take his principles. I take them to a USA football and that becomes heads up football. What is really kind of the model now was stimulated by Chuck. No, I am just, I just transitioned it. I don't take any credit for it, but I youth football needed some direction way back. (laughs) Well, I think I came on the board 2012, but you know, when football was really under attack, we need to give youth football some direction. It never had it. You didn't have any ways, you know, if you're a dad, you've never coached your mom, you've never coached, but you saw it, bless your heart for going out there, but wouldn't it be nice to have some tools to teach it with, right? So for sure, that exists today where it didn't exist for the majority of time that football has been around. He gave us the direction. He gave us the direction for youth sports. That's That was established way back when we launched it at the Hall of Fame almost a decade ago. That's what has become the golden rule. That is why when I started coaching, my son wanted to play at age seven, with your thinking that is exactly my thought process yeah. man at seven if we start teaching it now do you know how we're gonna, good we're going to be at 14 right it's a habit and that's now. everything throwing the ball tackling mm-hmm. running hand. i'm telling you this by the time we were 10 we could throw a post route as good as the high school team yeah you know people want to talk about oh colleges have really helped develop you know players when they go to the nfl and um, high schools no It's youth football. When you've taught these things at a young age, okay, listen, I love golfing. I didn't puck up golf until like 10 years ago. Now I see kids who've been playing, uh, my grandkids. Shoot, I just took my grandkids out. I'm like, you're better than I am in like six weeks. That stinks. But the advantage of learning things at a young age. A child's capacity to learn is ridiculous. better and safer. You're completely dead on. 
That that's uh, no exactly. And so my last question then tonight is, what feedback have you received from um, your book? I mean, since the publication, have other athletes, have other teammates, have they come to you? Have they given you any feedback about what you've written? Okay, now uh, it depends on it. If we're going to talk about uh, teammates, I, I guess you could group this all together. Yeah. People who don't who who have been fed by watching the news okay mm -hmm. that's where they've got, garnered all their information they've read the horror story or they want wa went and watched the movie concussion okay yeah there's their information because the people who watch the movie concussion mike webster was my roommate okay yeah i, I know th there's nobody who was more devastating uh devastated aside from obviously his family those please than when he passed away i mean just the man he was the person the friend that he was um and that now, now what I know today, I wish I would have known way back then because I could have been a better teammate yeah. to him. I always ask people, go, what did he die of? Well, uh, they point to their head. I'm like, Mike Webster died of heart failure. He had a stent in his heart, okay? Mike Webster had all kinds of health issues and had mental health issues on both sides of his family. Did you know any of that? Right. I know the movie didn't tell you that. And the movie led you to believe, and that is absolutely 100% garbage. So... Here's what the, the response I will get. If you if you come to me with that information, you have, uh, I can't believe, you know, that's not what I heard. That's not, I go, where did you hear it? What do you really know? What research have you done? When you start diffusing people by making them prove to you how you know what you know, mm -hmm. they don't know very much because they got it from a movie or they got it from the news. And then people who have read the book, who maybe even had that in, that vision and that information based on um, what I just told you, they come back and they're like, "Wow!" They're like, "Thank you!" Like, "Thank you!" Like yeah. you like, and you know what? In the book too, one part, and, I, and I'll leave you with this: we do hold people accountable. Here's the three things in life that really dictate your short and long term health: age genetics and lifestyle and i can look at those three things mm -hmm. right there and now listen it's not 100 percent, but i'll tell you this it's not far off no no you're right it's not far off and the one that everybody wants to neglect and overlook is the lifestyle right you know you've been drinking you've been eating poorly you haven't taken care of yourself but you're in bad health but you're blaming football for everything now hold the phone here now there's some accountability in life. And in the book, we do talk about that. Now, three things, three great things about that. Okay, you, you can't do nothing about the first two. Age, genetics, that's your deal. Right. It's nice to know our genetics because we could do some things and maybe alter some things. That's always nice to know that. It's great. You're you should be blessed that you're moving on in it life and you and you're still around. The lifestyle thing is critical. And to not take that into account for where you may be physically and mentally is an absolute, uh, uh, it's absurd mm -hmm. for people to do that and ignore that. And so many times that's what players have done. I've had many players tell me like, God, oh, you know, I, I'm going to go in there. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do very well in the cognitive test. I'm like, what? I'm like, you don't understand what this, okay. That is not what you, well, first of all, they're going to, they'll expose you. Okay. That, it's not like that. You yeah. Just so you know, too, the testing is too in depth. You just, but I'm like, that is just shameful to think like that, you know? And then you start talking, well, what have you been doing? You know, and there's no accountability with their life there. I bet you there's not a player I've talked to. And this, this is not a majority of players do this. There's a select few, like there is in society in general, looking for the free ride, trying mm -hmm. to find excuses, point fingers, cast blame, all that stuff that exists in a losing locker room and a pathetic locker room. Um, you know, you're not going anywhere in life with that type of recipe, you know? So if you want to try to live like, and you get away with that, um, well, you know, shame on you because somebody, you might be robbing somebody who really needs it and, and deserves it, you know, and has legitimate issues, mm -hmm. but if that's how you sleep at night, you know, shame on you, but that's on you. That's not on me. But, um, those things are all in our control. Right. You know, um, especially the, the lifestyle thing, the age genetics, as long as you know some genetic things, you can help curve some things and help some things. You're proactive in your health. I mean, there is your most, your greatest empowerment that you have this. I mean, don't be running around in fear. Don't be sitting there 
If you're worried about something, go ahead and do some research on it. Dig into some information, find out. And if you're concerned about head trauma, and what I like about my book is it is an empowering book. I mean, we give you a lot of positive things and information to help you too. This is not a doom and gloom. It's just the facts mm -hmm. and then the information to help you through the process, whether you're a coach, whether you have some problems, um, whether you might have some problems, ways to help you out of that and help you through it. And along those lines, just, I want to want to make sure I mentioned to everybody that your website, um, brainwashedbook.com, also provides some questions, right? Some questions to ask for a parent to ask their youth football coach. Some things yeah, that we, they can we outline. We do that in the book too, actually. Okay, the great. Book is there too, you know, things that you should ask in sports, and you know, probably the best way to find all of this is merrillhodge.com. Okay, it, that'll get that then. Uh, the brainwash stuff, all that stuff is right under that. So that, that gives you all the resources, but the book has that, you know, if you're a parent and this, I have my daughter's like this. She never played sports or her mm -hmm. husband's like this. My kid now I have, I'm a resource. I can help them. But like I tell them, I listen, go to your youth, bar, ask these questions, Yeah. do these things that exist in the book. We do that to help you with what should, and what should you hear? Not just ask them, what should you be told? You know, what should the response be? And if the response is A, then respond like this. You know, if they go, what do you guys do for head trauma? For We have a protocol? What? What do you mean? What do you mean protocol? Yeah, I, that's it. I need no more. Yeah. I'm going to find another place. <laughs> Hopefully they don't do that. Or, you know what, get involved and change it. Because, listen, you're the gatekeeper. We talk about gatekeepers. We hit that a second ago, and I said, you and I are gatekeepers. Right. I'm a teammate. I'm a parent. I'm a gatekeeper. You know, if I see a child, if I'm coaching and I see any kid that I think is suspect head trauma, I got to do my part to remove that child and make sure they don't return back to that environment until we make sure that they're okay. Well said. Um, thank you again so much, Merrill, for joining me tonight. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, I have a, just a few more moments. Is there anything else that you're currently working on that you'd like to take a moment to to plug, uh, you know, any of the inspirational, so I don't know what you have, you're able to even do those type of things nowadays with, uh, the outbreak going on, but is there anything well, else? Know, my, well, my first book was really find a way. And actually mm -hmm. that book is, is powerful for so many reasons. It still resonates with me in my life today. The book brainwashed stimulated from find a way, find a way has done this for me in my life. It started yeah. at age 12. It still exists today. It has inspired me. Those words have inspired me to always take action, do something about my circumstances, find out things about things that I might be confused on. And really I can blame the book, find a way and that mindset yeah. or the book brainwashed because I just couldn't let things go until I understood everything. And then eventually it turned into, there's no way you could share this all and people understand it. But if you condensed it in a book where they could digest it and do it at their pace, that was your better way. So um, my passion is motivational and inspirational speaking. That's what I, I do it more Zoom now. Mm -hmm. But that is what I, I'm passionate about. Um, I go to, I speak 30, 35 times a year. Um, if I had my way, I'd speak 300 because I need 65 days to travel. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, that's how much I love it. And what why I love it is because I try to leave people with this one message that what is really possible, what is possible for you, you Pete, anybody listen to you, what you really, you have within you that you might not even know exists, that maybe I could share something that happened to me that somebody got out of me, like a Walter Payton, a Chuck Dole, an Aristotle, and it could help you find your way to whatever you're striving for, to leave people with that, where they have an energy like, oh yeah, where they didn't, it doesn't become about listening to me. It's about, they all start talking about themselves and mm -hmm. what they now envision themselves doing. And that moves me, that moves me. Uh, and that's why I love doing it. And that is really my strongest passion right now. Absolutely. Fantastic. I think you're my spirit animal. I'm not going to lie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so w once again, uh, the website's merrillhodge.com brainwashedbook.com. And you, again, if you were just looking for the, the books themselves, you can purchase them on amazon.com as well. Sure. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Merrill, for joining us. I really appreciate it. I think it was a, a great uh, a great call. I'll try to continue to use my common sense, uh, but that's why I had you on. I actually did try to get Dr. Bennett Amaro on as well, and that, you know, he, he declined that, uh, that opportunity. 
But uh, yeah. well, he he only declined because you're probably going to ask him like, "Where's Mike Webster's brain?" And he just happened to lose that. And uh, can you prove all the other stuff that you have said scientifically? Can you show me that research? And yeah. they don't want to answer those questions because they can't answer them. And that that's that's a shame because they made a movie out of that guy. No and doubt, kind of, it's criminal. Quite honestly, if you. You didn't ask me, but I'm saying it's criminal for people to do stuff like that. And I don't know how one puts their head down at night and has peace with that. Yeah. They're just different than I am, I guess. All right. Um, thank you once again. I appreciate it. Have a good evening. And uh, thanks for joining the show. My pleasure. Thank nice, you. Pete. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Once again, that was uh, the Merrill Hodge, uh, former NFL running back for the Pittsburgh Steelers and Chicago Bears, author of Brainwashed. Um interesting discussion uh, I, I agreed with damn near everything he said I don't, I don't know that you know his his uh, energy is infectious his um, the information he had was firsthand it's always great to be able to talk to somebody who's just lived it they were there and they lived it what better place to get information from than from the source you know he was the the start of so many of these uh, head trauma protocols so who better to have on? I mean, it was really a coup for me to be able to get him on the show because I wanted to talk to where it began, you know, the genesis of this whole process. So, um, no, I, I love talking about how, you know, how the protocols were, what the protocols were back in the day and, and or what they weren't back in the day and then how they've changed over time. Uh, great stuff. So uh, what are your thoughts? If you um, if you'd like to talk to us, you certainly can. You can drop us a line. Just prove me wrong cast at gmail.com. That's the Gmail account. You can also find us on Facebook or Instagram. Prove me wrong is the name of the program. You just look it up. You can find us. If you're looking for the podcast itself, you just want to find a, a place to listen. We're on all podcast platforms, whether it be iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, TuneIn Radio, uh, Anchor. We're on all those platforms. Like and subscribe to the program, and you'll be notified when a brand new episode is released. We release them once a week. So every week we release a brand new episode and, uh, and you can be first in line to listen to it. We are also on YouTube and we're on Rumble, rumble.com. That's where you can find the video portions of the program. So, you know, if you're just listening right now, go over to YouTube or Rumble and watch the video of Merrill and I talking about his book, Brainwashed. Uh, interesting stuff. I, I really like the, the video myself. Like and subscribe to um, the program. And again, you'll be notified when a brand new episode is released. Before we go tonight, our episode tonight is brought to you by Zendo Zone Citronella Burners from JT Eaton. I'll put it right there in front of the camera so you can take a look at it. That's what a Zendo Zone looks like. Zendo Zones are shaped like fearless bug repellent tiki gods. Okay, as you saw there. So let Surf and Stan, Hawaiian Howie, and Luau Lily bring the islands to your backyard with Zendo Zone Citronella Burners. Zendo Zones uses natural 3% citronella candles and incense cones. They're perfect for patios, decks, backyards, campsite, poolside, and more. You can enjoy the outdoors again. So they are available now on Amazon.com and also at select Ace Hardware stores. So go ahead and uh, collect yours today. So once again, for my guest tonight, Merrill Hodge, uh, the author of Brainwashed, the Bad Science Behind CTE and the Plot to Destroy Football. Uh, you can find him again on MerrillHodge.com, BrainwashedBook.com, or you can find his books on Amazon.com. So for Merrill, uh, this is Pete Lieb with the Proving Your Own Podcast, and we will see you again soon.